scripture. Father, I thank you for the word that we're about to hear. I thank you that your word is life. And Lord, just speak to us. Have your word enter into our lives so that, Lord, we can change. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Turn with me if you have your Bibles, your iPhone, your iPad, or your eyelids to the book of Mark, chapter 16. The book of Mark, chapter 16. And the Bible says it was Saturday evening when the Sabbath had ended that Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of Jesus, and Salome, I love her, Salome. Somebody said, her name is Salome. No, it's not. Salome. They went out and they, they went to purchase burial spices, which causes me to pause and ask, where do you go buy burial spices? Especially on a Saturday night. <laughs> Was the Jerusalem Walmart able to accommodate? There's a burial section over there where you can buy clothes and anointing oils and burial spices. And, and of course, it was a Saturday night. I'm sure not all the funeral places were open. And so they finally found their burial spices so that they could do what? So that the next morning they would arrive at the tomb and anoint the body of Jesus again. In other words... They want to make sure that he doesn't rot, that, that he doesn't spoil, that his body does not contaminate in the grave. Now, of course, we know 2,000 years later, he's not there. But they are not, even though they are disciples, even though they had heard every message that Jesus had been preaching, especially in the last season of his life, I'm going to be crucified, I'm going to be buried, and then three days later, I'm going to rise from the dead, yet they still couldn't see it. They couldn't see it in the scriptures. They couldn't see it as he was speaking to them. And of course, the Bible says as they arrived that next morning, Sunday morning, resurrection, Easter morning, at sunrise, they went to the tomb and on their way to the tomb, watch, Mark is the only one of the four gospels that covers this conversation. And I think I have a theory behind it. On very uh, early in the morning, on the way, they were asking continually. So the, the tense verb asking, it's continually. It was, it was all they were talking about. Watch this. Watch the question. Who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance to the tomb? Who will roll away the stone for us so that we can get into the tomb and anoint the body of Jesus. I really would like to have covered and called this sermon what women worry about. <laughs> and Lori said, you do. I'm going to give you something to worry about. <laughs> My theory is that maybe Mark had a little issue. I don't know. But it's amazing. Here they are, early in the morning, Easter, arriving at the tomb, but when they discover, as they arrive, but as they arrive, they, keyword, they looked up they looked up and they saw that what they were concerned about was taken away. In fact, that large stone, that very large, heavy, probably weighed as much as 2,000 pounds and only four round disc-shaped stones have actually been found to this day in Israel. And those four were always at prominent people's graves. I'm talking about in the form of a king or a leader or a rich man. The other ones have been found that are square. You can do your own research. They're square with actually a cork shape. It's called a cork shaped stone. So it wasn't always rolled into place. It was pushed into place. And many archeological studies and, and these experts would even say that maybe that's exactly what they were wondering because it's not that easy to roll a square stone. And so they're asking these questions, and as they arrive, they realize, looking up, that the stone had been rolled away, and they entered, they entered into the tomb, and then they saw a young man clothed in white robes sitting on the right side, and the women were shocked. Translation, 2017, freaking out. <laughs> Husbands, don't say anything right there. <laughs> and the angel had to say to them, Stop freaking out do not be alarmed you're looking for Jesus of Nazareth who was 
crucified. He isn't here. He is risen from the dead. Take a look. Had not he been telling you over and over and over? Look where they put his body. He's gone. Now go and tell the disciples, including Peter. I love that. That's a big phrase. Go and tell the disciples. Oh, and tell Peter, who dropped the mic, if you will, and the ball. You go tell Peter he's included as well. He's not out of the number. Go and tell Peter that Jesus is going ahead of you into Galilee and you're going to see him there just as he told you before he died. And I just think on this Easter morning, we are all as guilty as those women in Mark chapter 16. On the greatest day ever, the greatest day ever in the world's history, we can be like these women on the way to our Easter service, worrying about what are we going to eat, who's going to cook, or let's just go a little bit deeper, worrying about, concerned about, fretting about situations, fretting and worrying and anxiety-filled life and conversations in the car. I pulled out, just literally out of the line, pulled over like a state trooper hiding, and I was watching some of y'all fight on the way coming up Westinghouse Road. Yeah, you got that church look now. You got that beautiful Easter spring color flowing. But y'all were choking each other coming up. <laughs> now, kids, when we get out of this car, you better change that attitude. <laughs> Husband, you better, you better get that off your face. I'm going to slap it off your face. <laughs> now, you all walk in there and all of a sudden, hallelujah. <laughs> and I just think, when these women show up, their conversation was, watch this, problem conscious, not resurrection conscious. In other words, their mind, their words, their thoughts, their attitude, everything was, who's going to roll the stone away for us? Isn't it amazing on that morning they as we look at it today, can say, wow, y'all are, number one, you're, you're, you're we're worried about problems that it's not a problem. And you're worried about yourself more than, than even God. And I just think on this resurrection morning, we need to stop and ask ourselves, what are we concerned about? What are we worried about? What are we burdened about? What's, what's in your life today? My mother, who I said passed away back in November, used to use a term, and, and it's a generational term that, that many of you, if you're old as I am, you, you've heard it. It's called borrowing trouble. My mother used to say, Joe, at my anxiety, at my worry, at my, my, my fears, I, I would begin to talk needlessly, worry needlessly. That's what it means to borrow trouble. And she would look at me and she'd say, stop. You already played out a scenario in your mind that is not going to happen. It's, it's worrying about something that you have no control over. It's worrying about what is going to be an issue that's really not an issue at all. And, and, and I think that you and I sometimes, we, we are worried about issues. We're worried about, about things even on this Sunday morning that God has taken care of. In fact, it's done. It's finished. We should be not just on Easter morning, but every morning of every day of our life, not problem conscious, but, but resurrection conscious. That we should be filled with this same power that raised Christ from the dead. The stone, really, you're worried about a stone? A 2,000 pound stone? A stone that God made? A stone that God said, I could have made talk. A stone that... It's a pebble to me. God, oftentimes throughout the scriptures, gives us all sorts of stories about stones. How about that little stone that hit Goliath in the forehead and, and dropped the giant like he was hot? And, and it's this little stone. In other words, that little bitty stone that came out of David's hand 
drop in this incredibly large, very large man who was ruling the world with fear and trembling. How much more can God move a big stone when it comes to the raising of his son Jesus from the dead? See, they were borrowing trouble. And I think a lot of us are, honestly, and this is the truth, wherever you are somewhere in the world, in our world, one meets few unworried people. In fact, this morning, we're wondering, are we alive? <laughs> you know now, I mean, in recent days, we're like, where's the mother bomb gonna drop this week? I mean, we're all like, they were trying to shoot a rocket yesterday. And it blew up a couple of seconds later. I mean, we're just like, whoa, what's up? We all are dealing with anxiety, with fears, and, and what are they? What are our concerns? What's causing us not to sleep? And there are concerns. We've got concern over work, which connects us to our finances. We're concerned about our jobs. We're concerned about money. We're concerned about paying the bills. Maybe we're concerned about our home. Well, of course, that's probably the biggest and the, the bulk of our worries. We're worried about maybe our marriage or our children or our children's health. After the last service, I prayed for a young lady who's in stage four cancer with four little girls. It's a lot of worry. And of course, we do know that a lot of our, a lot of concerns are over politics or the world's issues, or maybe, maybe for you, it's your past. Maybe it's um, tax season that's a big worry to you. Lori said, the last words that she said to me after I love you was, I filed our taxes. <laughs> Oh, thank God. The stone has been rolled away. <laughs> or how about, how about your future? How about, how about death? Maybe that's what you're worried about. Maybe some of you, and like all of us now, the closer we get to that day, it seems like it's getting faster and faster. I go to more funerals than I've ever gone to in my life. And what you and I have to realize is that there's going to come a day when we are going to have to die. I hate to tell you, but 100%. <laughs> Unless fake news will tell you, 98%. <laughs> and if somebody's reporting that only 98% of us will die, that's called fake news. And 100% of us will die. And why did Christ come? He came to deal the death blow to death. He came to deal the death blow. He, he came to knock out the death problem. He came to knock out our worries, our fears caused by our past. He came to deal with every single situation that you and I have to deal with in this life. You see, what happens to a lot of people, of course, that in this world, like these women on their way to the tomb on that Easter morning, they, 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 they were lacking clarity. They were, they were lacking conviction concerning what Christ had said. They were lacking confidence, like, well, Christ is going to be in there, so we better go ahead and get ready to put some burial spices on him. We got to keep him from rotting and, and spoiling and, and stinking up the the whole world they, they 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 frankly had lost what i would describe their peace they had no peace and of course what happens when we lose our peace we lose our courage we lose our clarity we lose our confidence we lose and we begin to lose we lose in every area of life and you see, when Christ comes back to this world, what is he declaring over our lives? He, some of the very first words that he said is peace. Peace. You see, here's what the Bible tells us in the book of Philippians, and it's a connection to the resurrection of Christ. Philippians says, don't worry. Paul writes this. Don't worry about anything. Come on, say the word anything. Anything. Jesus said, have no worry about anything. What does the word anything in the Greek mean? Nothing. Nothing. <laughs> or anything. <laughs> Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need. Thank him for all that he's done. And then you're going to experience what? God's peace. Roll that onto God. Roll that stone that you're worried about, that problem that you're worried about, that heavy, large issue that you're worried about. And it can go from your physical to your finances. It can go from your, your family to your future. Roll that on him. Why? Because God has already taken care of it. 
Then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and your minds as you live in Christ Jesus. What's interesting is the previous verse. Let every one of you that are considerate or every one of you that are gentle in your spirit first walk in that way. But then he says, remember, the Lord is near. Why is the Lord a near? Why, why is he a present God? Notice the context. He's alive. Now when you read Philippians chapter 4, verse 6, you read it with verse 5 in mind. Because the Lord is alive, don't worry about anything. When the scriptures were written, they were not written in the form that we read it today with numbered verses. I think Paul was saying, because of Christ's resurrection, what are you worried about? What are you fearful about? What are you struggling with? A lot of us are pondering a lot of things. There's some stupid things that people talk about. Pondering. This is what those women were doing on the road to the tomb. How about these ones? Uh, we, we ponder this one. Um, why is the word abbreviated such a long word? <laughs> Seems like it should be shorter than that. Why do, why do what, what doctors do, why do they call that a practice? I don't want no doctor practicing on me. Or why is the man who invests all your money called a broker? That's a good one. <laughs> or why don't they take that indestructible black box that we hear about? Why don't they make the whole plane out of that? I don't, I don't get that. <laughs> or why do they call apartments apartments when they're all stuck together? They're, they're not apart. <laughs> or why do they call and, and declare that flying is so safe and then they call the airport a terminal? I don't, I don't, I don't get that one either. <laughs> Or why do we call an incident that was almost a collision a near miss? Should it not be called a near hit? I mean, it just seems like... <laughs> if it was a near miss, it must have hit something. <laughs> Some of you are like, I don't get that one. Okay. <laughs> what are you pondering? What's your problem? Let's just go backwards. Let's get into the text. Let's get into the scriptures. Because every scripture was written for you and for me. Christ came down and the book of Ephesians tells us that we were one day separated from God. Separated from the promises of, of Israel. Strangers outside of not just the covenants but outside hope. Without God in this world. But now Christ came. You who once were formerly afar off have now been brought near by what? By the blood of Jesus. Through his cross, he, he bore for us in his body our problems. He bore and he came for himself. He is our peace who made all of that that was dividing and all of that that was distracting and all of those issues. Because you've got to go back and remember this. The word worry literally in the Greek means to be divided. It means to be drawn away. See, that's what happens. Worry draws you away from the resurrection of Christ. Worry draws you away. It distracts you. And it puts your mind on things that's nothing to God. Are you worried? That's what Jesus came to do. He in his flesh, the Bible says, he abolished all of that division in his flesh, thus establishing peace, verse 15. See, this peace that we have is in Christ. That's why he does say in some of those very first words, peace be unto you. I just want to close as we wrap up our opportunity just to respond today. I just want to make four statements about, about that stone being rolled away. But more importantly, about what resurrection really is all about. What Easter, what Easter really says. Number one, there isn't a problem God can't solve. There's not a problem. Easter solves the resurrection solves every problem. Every problem. Every problem. Because the same power that raised Christ from the dead is in you. Same power. And if that was destroyed, if that power was broken, then every power that is trying to break you down is broken. Jeremiah said it like this, is there anything too hard for God? Behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is anything too difficult for me? Is anything too complicated for me? What are you worried about? He's not here. 
He's risen. You showed up having bought all those spices. You showed up having ready to prepare your life and your future for funerals. It ain't necessary anymore, girls. Salome. Go to Galilee. Get out of this tomb. Get out of this tomb. He's not here. Get out of your way of thinking that you're going to die. Get out of your way of thinking that life is over. Get out of your last day hunker and bunkering yourself down as a prepper. What are you doing in a tomb? I'm going 12 feet. Boy, you're going to be knocking on my door. When the world ends, you're going to be knocking on my door wanting my food. Well, guess what the Bible says you're supposed to do? Let me and every one of my friends in that world, and I'm going to eat all your food. Thank you very much. I know some of y'all, I know, I, know, I got some preppers. We, got, we live in Williamson County. We got, we got some preppers out here. You left Travis County for a reason, okay? Number two, there isn't a place that God can't go. You say, Pastor John, I'm going to some bad places. I'm going to some bad places. It could be on the internet. It could be after work. It could be at a hotel meeting somebody, some girl, some guy. You've been to some bad places. Your past. Maybe you got some plans. God's already been there. He went to the deepest, darkest pit called the tomb where they put Christ in. And God took care of that too. If I ascend, the psalmist said, into heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. You know why God... Went to hell. In fact, the Bible tells us he went in those three days of his burial. He preached into hell and took the keys from the devil who had the power of death, hell, and the grave. He went into prison. During that time, you think, what was Jesus doing? Sleeping? No, he was kicking the devil's butt for you and for me. Did he say butt? Did you just say butt? Theologically, the devil doesn't have a butt. He's got horns, but he doesn't have a butt. He's got a pitchfork, but he doesn't have a butt. He was taking back, in fact, the Bible tells us, he came to defeat the works of the devil. And when you go into those hellish places, God's there. He's there. You can't turn him off. You can't stop God from going with you to the tombs. Some of you are in a tomb of relationships. You're with a boy or a girl that is death, and it's killing you. God is there to help you out. Maybe you go to a dark place called, called an alcohol place, a place for drugs. God's there, and he's not turned off. He doesn't stop loving you. He doesn't turn his back on you. And you have prayed maybe a million times, and God says, pray a million and one. I'm there. That's what the empty tomb said. That's what that stone rolled away means. Here's the third one. There isn't a past that God cannot forgive. There is not a problem he can't solve. There's not a place he can't go. There isn't a past that God can't forgive. Well, Pastor Joe, you haven't met my past. Oh, so you're the one of all the billions of people. Really, you think your sin, your past, is bigger than any past in the history of of mankind really really not in texas maybe in dc but not <laughs> in texas that's why jesus does say peace be with you as the father has sent me i send you and when he had said this he breathed on them and said to them receive the holy spirit in other words they were bound by worry in an upper room and jesus made that statement Jesus would have never said peace had it not been true. And when he makes the statement, peace, my father sent me, in the context that I just read, my father sent me to tell you this message. It's all good. Peace. What, Pastor Joe? What, Jesus? What are you talking about? Your past, your sins. It's all good. I took it. It's over. It's done. Forgiven. Now I send you with the same message. Joe, you stand up there on that platform Easter morning and you tell them, peace be unto you, and you forgive them. 
You let them know that as they and we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, you let them know that I paid for their sins. Receive the Holy Spirit. See, he would have never given you and he would have never given them the gift of the Holy Spirit had he not taken care of their past problems. I mean, as a parent, you know, there are some times when you know you need to give your child another chance. They broke the first one. And you have to just go, oh, no, you're going to have to prove. I want 12 more years of obedience before you get another one. <laughs> you killed the last dog. <laughs> you're not going to kill this one. And Jesus took care of whatever past problems. And then lastly, as the worship team comes, here, here's, the, here's the next statement. This is what Easter does. This is what it says to us. There isn't a person God can't change. The Bible says, watch this. In the same book that we've been preaching from, Mark chapter 16, anyone, come on, would you say that word, anyone? Anyone who believes. Anyone. Whosoever believes. When Jesus was crucified, they put over his head a sign, and it was written in Latin, it was written in Greek, and it was written in Hebrew, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. Why? They didn't realize that they were declaring the prophetic truth that God came into the world to save the world. The world, not the religious world. The world lost, the whole world. We're all lost. I was a lost boy. My dad, mom, wonderful people. My dad was an NFL football coach, National Football League. NFL stands for not for long. Lived every two, three years in a new city, which was fantastic. As a little boy growing up, your dad's the NFL coach in that city. It was cool. A lot of friends. I used it to my advantage. Gave tickets away to my teachers to pass. Not because I said it. My dad told me to do it. He said, boy, you ain't getting out unless you go take these tickets and get that math teacher to let you slide. How many had some parents that knew how to make some things happen? My dad was from Mississippi. My mom was from Mississippi. Mom came from a Catholic background. Dad came from a Baptist background. And coming together, they went, we never want to go to church again. <laughs> and they had both seen religion. They'd both seen their expressions of faith that they were raised in ways that just turned them in a different direction. So by the time I'm born, Mom and dad are done with church. They're not anti, they're not anti-God, they're not anti-Christ. It just, church was not in our world at all. Most of the time because half the season was Sunday mornings. And then I heard about Jesus. Two players of my father's, Greg Berzina, and Ralph Ortega, Atlanta Falcons, age of 14, first time I'd ever heard, God loves you, Joe, and has a plan for your life. And then it would begin to mature Peggy and Jack Benson brought me to First Baptist Church in Natchez, Mississippi. And Brother Odeen Puckett preaching on that Sunday morning. Brother Odeen Puckett. I love Brother Puckett. I walked down the aisle of that baby blue carpeted First Baptist Church in Natchez, Mississippi. You don't get any Southern Baptist more than that. It's just, I top all of y'all from a Baptist background. And he shook my hand. He said, today, as Joseph comes forward, he accepts Jesus as his personal Lord and Savior and publicly confesses him. And all who are in agreement to receive him into membership of the kingdom of God and the body of Christ, would we all say, I, I. Then I went to college, and then there was another moment, January the 10th, 1987, playing football at LSU. God spoke to me. And here I am doing what I'm doing now. I was in the world. But God, the Bible says, if anyone believes, anyone who believes, now watch what he says in Mark 16. Anyone, anyone, I don't care where you're from. I don't care if you've hated God your whole life. Anyone who believes, and then he goes, and is baptized. In other words, you're not just, you're not just believing in Christ, but now you're going to step into the tomb. You know, that's the second thing. They, they looked up, that's, that's looking to Jesus. You believe in Christ as your Lord and Savior. But then they entered in. Okay, so now Jesus gives us an entering in to his life. It's called water baptism. If anyone will do this and believe, if they will believe and be baptized, they will be saved. This is Jesus. But anyone who refuses to believe will be condemned. Notice what he says. 
He doesn't say baptism in the second clause in the second phrase. Anyone who believes and is baptized will be saved. Anyone who does not believe will be condemned. In other words, the loss of eternal life is not through baptism, it's through your believing. But I do believe Mark is saying, if anyone is really a believer, they will be baptized. Doesn't save you. We know the thief on the cross said, Jesus, remember me. And he goes, today you'll be with me. He didn't get off that cross. He didn't say, now, if you get off that cross and get in that water, I'll, I'll save you. He didn't do that. He's just as saved as anybody. But I'm going to ask you to do something. Number one, I'm going to ask you to look to Jesus. And then after this service, on your way out, we have baptismal tanks available. And you can be one of the 50 plus that were baptized last night. Well, Pastor Joe, I don't have any clothes. We got t-shirts. We got shorts. We have towels. I have mascara. <laughs> Hair products. Got everything available for you. What better day on Easter after believing in the Lord Amen. and to be baptized, looking to Jesus and stepping into his life can be the greatest day of your life. Some of you have believed, but you've never been water baptized. Pastor Joe, that's crazy. We have it all taken care of. It'll never be easier. That's why some of you said, like last night, one lady said, I've never been water baptized as a believer because it was always hard for me to plan all that. And then today, she said, I had no excuses. Would you bow your heads, please? I want to give you an opportunity to say yes to God. How many of you would say, Pastor Joe, first of all, I've been worried. I'm a worrier. If that's you, would you just slip up your hand? You're the worrier. Yeah. And some of you are worried to raise your hand. Okay. Get, get it up. Come on. This is not about a religious activity. Would you, t you just put your hand down? It, it, I'm not trying to get you to do something religious. We're not taking pictures. I don't have a GoPro on my forehead. But God brought you here to set you free from worry. Because whatever problem you're worried about, God's already taken care of it. And the scenario that you've already played in your mind, God says that's a vain imagination. And I'm the King of kings and the Lord of lords over that. It's time to drop the worry. I don't care how big and bad you might be, sir. You can be a tattoo-wearing, bicep-bulked-up dude, and you're a worried person. You're jealous. And worry and jealousy are all connected. God wants to set you free. Maybe you're here today and you say, Joe, I, I have loved God and I have had a relationship to God and I, I have um, confessed him, but you know what? I'm out of fellowship with God. I want to rededicate my life. As heads are bowed, eyes are closed. How many say, that's me, that's me, that's me. I want to rededicate my life on this Easter. In fact, Pastor Joe, I haven't seen you since last Easter. <laughs> I know, I look, I watch you. But you know what? I take anybody when they come and that's Jesus, anybody. Some of you need to believe again. You have rejected the God of your mother or the God of your father. And you know what? You've, you've, you've walked out on another God. You, you've walked out on their God, their religious God. But that's not their God. I'm talking about the God that I'm preaching from the scriptures here today that loves you. How many would like to reconnect back to church? Let me see your hand all over this place. You, you know you need to be in the body. You know it. You know it. But what you walked away from was not church. You, you walked away from the way they used to do church. And we don't do church that, that way. We do it the way that we find it in the, in the scriptures, just like you've experienced. And then thirdly, here's the big one. How many of you would say, Joe, I don't think I'm saved. And that death issue, I'm not ready to die yet because I don't know where I'm going to go. And I want to take that question mark off of my life. I don't want to have any doubts as to having eternal life. Jesus said, whoever believes in him will live forever. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed, just a quiet moment. How many of you would say, Joe, that's me. I, I want to receive Jesus as my savior. Would you just, just simply, just, just lift your hand just a little bit all over this place. I'm not going to ask you to stand. I'm not going to have you embarrassed. Please just, just put, say, Jesus, that's me. That's all I'm asking you to do is give God a signal. It'd be like a handshake. If I walked up to you and I wanted to say hello to you, I'm going to extend my hand. How many of you would say, I want to give God right now my hand. I want to give God a handshake. God, save me. See my hand. See my hand. All over this place. Yeah, hundreds right now are raising their hands all over this place. All over this place. All over this place. Don't miss this moment. Don't be worried about death anymore. You know why? God has taken care of death for you. 
You may put your hand down. Would you look at me for a moment? They said, who is going to roll the way the stone for us? Okay, this is the big one. I want to close with this. How am I going to walk this Christian life? It's already been done for you. It's already been done for you. Do you hear that? Christianity is not do. Christianity is done. He did it. It's over. It's finished. It's already rolled. It's already done. It's nothing to do but what? Believe and enter in. In the seat back in front of you, if your hand went up for one or two things or even three things, you need prayer. But if those that just raised their hand for dedication or rededication, I want you to look at those connection cards in the front. Would you take that out? And on your way out, I want you to, I want you to fill that out. Wait, give a response. And then we have connection centers. I want you to take that card. And I want you to tell somebody, this is the decision that I made. Rededication, or maybe it's a prayer request. Write that down. But we want to put in your hand a book. And it's the 10 steps towards Christ. It's going to help you on the next step. We do everything here at Celebration Church by steps. God gives us steps. That's why every service we have growth track. I just found out, actually, because of the crowd, they had to cancel the growth track. So don't stick around. There will be no growth track. Can we stand to our feet today? Hey, don't rush away. If you're here today and you've never been water baptized, or today you've believed and now you want to be water baptized, don't rush out. Get baptized. Do it today. Can we thank God for the people that just made decisions for Jesus all over this place?